Earlier this month, we celebrated the feast day of St. Teresa, the Little Flower. And I'd just like to speak about her for a few minutes. On September 30th, 1897, a 24-year-old French Carmelite nun died of tuberculosis in her cloistered convent in Lucie, France. She had been a nun there for nine years, entering at the age of 15. When Carmelites die, it's a traditional practice for the Mother Superior to send out a notification of death called a circular to the other Carmelite convents, sharing with the nuns of other communities some insights into the life and virtues of the deceased. A few weeks before death, St. Teresa overheard two of the sisters talking outside her infirmary door. Well, I'm sure I don't know what Mother Price is going to say about Sister Teresa when she dies. One of them said, she hasn't done anything. Hearing this, Teresa smiled to herself. It was true. In the eyes of the world, she had done nothing extraordinary. Before her death, however, St. Teresa confided some remarkable things to her sisters, Pauline, Marie, and Celine, nuns like her in the order. My mission, she said, is about to begin. I will not rest until time is no more. I will spend my heaven doing good on earth. I will let fall a shower of roses. All the world will love me. Knowing how fond Teresa was of flowers, her sisters brought roses from the convent garden when the invalid could no longer get up. St. Teresa gently pulled the fragrant petals apart, scattering them around her crucifix. Save them, she told her sisters. Very soon, they will be quite useful to you. Were these the fantastic delusions of a very sick nun, or were they truly remarkable prophecies? How did this obscure nun of 24, living her brief and sheltered life, known to just a handful of people beyond her immediate family circle, become, as Pope St. Pius X called her, the great saint of modern times? What occurred almost immediately after her death is a remarkable story. Sometime before, Teresa had been asked by her sister Pauline, prioress at the time, to put in writing some recollections of the childhood and family life they had shared together. Teresa began her story of a soul under obedience, writing in her darkened room every night in the 20 minutes of free time a lot of the nuns after an exhausting day of work and prayer. Several months before death, while suffering intensely, the new prioress, Mother Gonzague, commanded St. Teresa to write something about her life in Carmel, hoping to use it for the circular to be sent out after her death. Thus, two more chapters were added to her journal. Finally, her sister Marie begged St. Teresa to share with them some of her thoughts about the spiritual life. These pages complete her autobiography. For all intents and purposes, St. Teresa wrote it for no eyes but those of her prioress and her sisters. A month before her death, however, St. Teresa told Pauline that the book would do much good. It will make the mercy and goodness of God better known. Before starting, I knelt before the statue of Mary. I begged her to guide my hand so that I should not write a line that would displease her. So her story of a soul begins. It was not a literary classic, but St. Teresa's sisters felt it would benefit others to have it published. The manuscript was published and modestly distributed around the convent of Lisieux. Soon, some of the nuns sent copies to their own families or relations. Requests for more came quickly. The con was soon besieged with letters, asking for articles of clothing or anything that might belong to Sister Teresa. That instinctive Catholic spirit, that same which led thousands to Fatima and to the grotto at Lourdes, now sensed that the finger of God was here in the life of this obscure nun. She, whom Pope Pius XI called a prodigy of miracles and a miracle of prodigies, was about to begin her mission on earth. The miracles St. Teresa began working from heaven were astounding, astounding. Accounts of healings, prayers answered, marvelous conversions, 
began pouring into Carmel. The nuns were overwhelmed with the amount of work St. Teresa now gave them. She who had shunned anything extraordinary and prayed to remain hidden throughout her life now came on like a, another St. Joan of Arc, amazing the entire world with her extraordinary deeds. Her autobiography was translated into many languages. Seminarians, priests, and missionaries took her as a spiritual sister and confided their work to her. Teresa did not fail them. It was not long before Rome took notice in the rule limiting the amount of time which must pass before a cause of sainthood could be introduced to Rome was waived in her behalf. Less than 30 years after her death, St. Teresa was canonized by Pope Pius XI. The following year, she was declared patroness of the missions, together with the Jesuit St. Francis Xavier. My dear beloved in Christ, another prophetic, among her prophetic insights, Teresa told her sisters, I will come down. And she did. During World War I, soldiers on the battlefields of France saw her walking among the wounded. Children in hospitals beheld her smiling by their bedsides. Stories such as the following are typical of St. Teresa. After the war, a wealthy businessman walked into a plush French hotel late one night. He was astonished to see a Carmelite nun alone in the lobby. The nun was smiling at him. Turning to the desk, he inquired of the attendant who that nun might be, but was assured that he was the only one to come into the lobby for some time. Besides, what would a Carmelite nun be doing all alone in a hotel so late at night? Days later, this man was surprised to see a portrait of this very same Carmelite at the home of friends who told him she was St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. This wealthy and worldly man became a Trappist monk. In canonizing the saints, the church sets them before our eyes as models, teachers, intercessors, as heavenly patrons. In giving St. Teresa to the modern world, God shows us that sanctity and holiness do not consist in the performance of heroic or great things, but in the humble fulfillment of the duties in our state in life. This is exactly what our Lord explained to Saint Sister Lucy when he told her, the penance I now demand is the faithful fulfillment of one's duties of state. But this fidelity is not merely doing a good job. Perfection is not perfectionism. There's something more to it. What St. Teresa calls her little way is also referred to as the way of spiritual childhood. By it, she reminds us of those words of our Lord. Unless you turn and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The disposition of the soul who seeks God sincerely must take on these qualities of childhood, trust and abandonment in the arms of a loving providence. St. Teresa reminds us that children ordinarily, unless they're childhood prodigies, are not capable of great things, nor are they expected to do great things. Little children do not have to earn the love of their fathers and mothers. They're loved by them unconditionally. They're always loved this way. St. Teresa was convinced that God's love for each soul surpasses infinitely the love of any parent on earth. My dearly beloved in Christ, we see what she means if we take a look at the ideal family Teresa had the happiness of being part of. Most of us not know what an ideal family is. It's something we've only read about. Her Autobiography amazes us by the amount of love that abounded in the Martin household and surrounded Teresa from her earliest childhood. Her parents, Louis and Zelie Martin, were saints in their own right. How truly devout was that family. How abundantly the Martins gave alms and loved the poor. Evenings were spent reading the lives of the saints in the liturgical year. Attendance at daily mass, frequent communion, Sunday vespers in the evening. Truly, God was the center of that blessed family. Teresa was the youngest of eight children, three of whom died in infancy. Teresa's love for her papa and his for his 
little queen bring tears to one's eyes. She knew her father was a saint. She would watch his face in rapt attention while the priest explained the passion of our Lord and saw tears rolling down his cheeks. The hours they spent together side by side while he fished and she made small mud pies he pretended to eat. Her story is full of charming memories of a happy childhood that seems to come from a different world. But the idea was necessary to build up St. Teresa, the foundation in St. Teresa, the foundation of her spirituality. God raised up the Martin family and gave it to us as an example, a type of his own fatherly love for his children. To understand God's love is to understand everything. Everything that God does, everything that he allows to happen to us. For St. Teresa, then, all revolves around the concept of family. Heaven is a family reunion. When we die, we're just going home. All her life, St. Teresa longed for heaven. She saw earth for exactly what it is, an exile. When joys come, we thank God for them, but we cannot pretend that earth joys will ever make fully content a heart that was made for God. As a child, it caused Teresa great pain to think that there were souls who did not love God and would never see him in heaven. Hearing that a notorious murderer named Pranzini, who had refused to be reconciled to God, was sentenced to be hanged, Teresa was heartbroken. She set about praying and making all the sacrifices she could think of. On the morning after Pranzini's execution, she ran to get the newspaper before her father. There she read, to her immense joy, that just as Pranzini was mounting the scaffold, he suddenly turned, as if by inspiration, to the priest, took hold of the crucifix, offered him, and, devout, and devoutly kissed the wounds of Christ with much emotion. Her prayer, she was certain, had been answered. She called Pranzini her firstborn. The cloister of Carmel was chosen by Teresa because there she would find the most perfect way to give up everything, to sacrifice everything for the salvation of souls, that God might be loved. Once in Carmel, Teresa realized that she would never be able as a cloister nun to do the deeds the saints are expected to do, perform miracles, sail to far-off places, and convert thousands, etc. However, she knew that God calls all souls to holiness, so she tried to find a way that she, weak as she was, incapable of doing great deeds, could still become a great saint. Her prayer was answered when she came across these words from the Old Testament. Whoever is a little one, let him come to me. She understood that to become a saint, one needs to become smaller, not greater. Reading the epistles of St. Paul, she saw that without humility and charity, the most heroic deeds, even martyrdom, are as nothing. That love alone counts. Her soul expanded in the revelation of this truth. I found my vocation, she cried, in the heart of my mother, the church. I will be love. Teresa said that treatises on the spiritual life only gave her a headache. She turned to the Gospels and there found everything she needed. In them, she saw the Holy Family living a life quite simple and ordinary. Our Lady, her Heavenly Mother, became the inspiration of her little way. Teresa's biographers don't always make this connection, namely what an immense part Our Lady played in the formation of St. Teresa's spirituality. It'd be a mistake to imagine that Teresa came forth from God a ready-made saint because this is far from the truth. Teresa herself readily admits her faults. After she turned three, her natural, cheerful disposition disappeared when her mother died. She became a temperamental child, giving to crying spells, headaches, extreme shyness, sensitiveness, and scruples. She had a stubborn and willful streak that sometimes exasperated even her patient father. However, she was always immediately sorry for her faults and would show it by an abundance of tears. As soon as she stopped crying, she would cry because she had cried in the first place. <laughs> Teresa struggled against her faults without success until she was about 14. On Christmas night, she writes, it was the child, 
Jesus, himself so small, who deigned to work a marvelous change within her. Scruples, tears, fretting, vanished in an instant. And the happy disposition of her early years returned. She refers to this grace as her conversion. Now her will was firm with the strength she did not she knew did not come from herself. It was this strength of will, fortified by the gift of fortitude, which Teresa used in Carmel to carry out her program. Perfect fidelity through love of the holy rule and a heroic patience of practice of fraternal charity because love of God and neighbor are inseparable. In the fulfillment of her rule, St. Teresa asked for no dispensations. She tough, suffered intensely from the cold of the Normandy winters. She was given the most disgusting leftovers to eat because she never complained. Her companion at table drank all the water allotted them, leaving none for St. Teresa, who said nothing. An old nun behind her constantly rattled her rosary beads, and St. Teresa resisted the natural impulse to turn around and give her a look of annoyance. Her brief life was made up of all these little things constantly given with great love. This unceasing denial of herself in little ways for the love of God carried Teresa rapidly up the summit of perfection. For people who find prayer and meditation challenging, St. Teresa offers us great encouragement. Although Carmelites devote their entire lives to prayer, St. Teresa admits her difficulty with both vocal prayer and meditation. Although she spoke so highly of the value of the rosary, she had great difficulty keeping her mind on the mysteries. Her prayer was accompanied by weariness and distraction, often just plain falling asleep. Did this difficulty in prayer trouble her? Not in the least. Parents love their children even when they're sleeping, she wrote. Such was her trust. For me, St. Teresa wrote, prayer is a cry of the heart, a simple glance toward heaven. It's a cry of recognition and love, both in trial and in joy. Prayer is not just for the times we kneel down and open up a prayer book. Nothing prevents us from lifting up our soul to God in the simple cry of the heart. No occupation is so consuming that we cannot make during it a simple glance toward heaven. When asked on her sickbed what she said to God, she replied, I say nothing. I just love him. Everything is love for St. Teresa. Prayer, sickness, work, pain. Thus, as she wrote, everything is a grace. St. Teresa's love prompted her to offer herself as a victim to the merciful love of God. At the close of her life, a spiritual martyrdom began, which was more painful than any physical suffering. Her lively faith, unshaken reliance upon the eternity of God's love and happiness awaiting her in heaven, seemed to disappear. Heaven closed its doors, and in the agony of her soul, the evil spirits tempted her to believe there was no heaven at all. Everything St. Teresa had counted on now seemed to her a great lie, a mockery. But she went on in the darkness, making constant acts of faith with her will, clinging to God's love. Someone, somewhere, she prayed, would receive the gift of faith through this suffering. St. Teresa once said that she wanted to live in the latter times when the faithful would be severely tested and endure the frightful torments of the Antichrist. As we perhaps see these times approaching, we can hope that St. Teresa will come down again, that she will help us by her powerful prayers. We can all learn something from him, from her, no matter what our vocation is or what particular crosses we have to bear. It's not because I've been preserved from mortal sin that I fly to God with loving confidence, she writes. I know I should still have this confidence, even if my conscience were burdened with every possible crime. I know that he loved the prodigal son. I've heard his words to St. Mary Magdalene, to the woman taken in adultery. No, no one could frighten me, for I know what to think of his love and mercy. Through her, we too can know what to think of his love and mercy. May St. Teresa intercede and pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.